This section uh, deals with preparation tips and we'll also look over some samples from advances in nutrition. The first tip I have is, if possible, create vector figures. Um, any artwork that can be created as vector artwork and maintained as vector throughout our graphics processing will process with the with the highest possible quality. The, the, the simple rule, vectors wonderful. <laughs> um, but a lot of stuff cannot be made vector when you're scanning something or microscope capture. There's no way you can turn it into a vector. So it's just not possible to always do it. So. Um, most of the tips that we're about to see are actually related to raster artwork, you know, photos, microscope captures, also artwork effects like drop shadows, transparency, those kind of things are all raster also. So we'll be talking mostly about that. Um, and when you're considering quality, um, you'll want to consider print. It's actually easier to create good quality for a monitor. Um, uh, as a general rule, monitors don't require as much resolution to display an image that will look good. You need more resolution for an image to look good in print than you do on a monitor. So since uh, if, you're, if, if a particular figure is going to be printed, you'll want to consider the print quality um, when creating the figure. So when taking photos, whether it's through a microscope or um, through a digital camera, you'll want to consider print qualities and you'll want to find settings that maximize the quality. Um, here's a question that I always like to ask uh, people. I used to ask students when I used to teach, photo teach Photoshop. Does high resolution equal quality? And uh, is anybody out there willing to go out on a limb and try to answer this? Well, the best, the best answer I have is perhaps, but not necessarily. In actuality, what resolution really equals is size. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. I'm going to go ahead and open up a, uh, a JPEG here. And I'm going to open it in Photoshop. And as you can see, um, it would be kind of hard to call this a, a quality image. Um, not only is the, 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 the shot itself is terrible, it's completely uh, blown out. But as you can see, you can actually see some very major fuzziness. It's not, it's not a good picture. <laughs> nobody, nobody would say that this is a quality image. How and let's look at another one here. Uh, I'll open up another JPEG in Photoshop, and now that looks like a pretty high quality image, I would say. Well, let's take let's compare these in actual terms of resolution. If I op if I go to my this picture, which we agree is low quality, and if I go to my image size dialog box. I'll see something very interesting. I've actually got 5,000 pixels in width and 4,000 pixels in height. That makes it 8, 9 inches wide at 600 ppi. This image has a lot of resolution. But if I look at my other picture and I go to my image size dialog box, I've only got 600 pixels of resolution in width, 764 in height and it's only 200 ppi at 3 inches wide. So this image has far less resolution than this image. So I, I know this is somewhat unfair because resolution is a part of quality. The difference is, is resolution, high resolution doesn't mean quality. Quality is determined by a number of factors. Resolution is one of the factors, certainly. This, no matter how, this picture is never going to look good, no matter how much resolution it has. However, this one looks good at this size, but if you do zoom in, if you tried to print this large, you'd see that if you zoomed in, you do have pixel, you know, you have pixel issues. Um, it's all about size. This, this image right here would look fine printed at about three inches wide, 
but if you tried to print it 10 inches wide, then it wouldn't look as good. But that's, that's the difference. Um, resolution does not necessarily equal quality. So, when we're talking about, um, okay, let me see if I can get back to where I was. So, resolution equals size. That's what's really key. When you're looking, when you're using your digital camera to capture uh, pictures, the two formats that are most common in digital cameras are JPEG and RAW. Quality has a lot to do with these. When you're choosing JPEG quality settings, you're really talking about compression. Um, and that makes sense. The higher quality settings are not going to compress as much, which means that the file sizes will be larger. But if you use lower quality compression settings, you're going to um, have very small files, but you're going to have quality issues. The other format that digital cameras sometimes use is RAW format. And you can consider this to be a digital negative in a way. Um, not all cameras have the ability to capture data in RAW format. So it, it really depends on the camera. Um, and I can explain this really quickly. In RAW format, that is the exact data that the sensor picks up when you open the shutter. Um, whereas JPEG, what happens is you open the shutter, sensor picks up data, and then it's actually converted within the camera to a JPEG file. You can never get the actual data collected from the sensor. But if your camera can, can capture raw format, it's the actual raw data coming from the sensor, not converted at all. So my suggestion, if you have a camera that can capture data in raw format, use it. Um, that's, that's your best way to get the highest quality out of your camera. Capture it in raw, and once you've captured it, you'll need to convert it to a TIFF because RAW is specific to the particular camera. To, to use it for any other purpose, you'll have to convert it to uh, some other format, like TIFF. So what you're going to want to try to do is find a balance of quality versus size, because there's no doubt if you're using a high-resolution camera, these images can take up a lot of room. As long as you've got space on your memory card in your camera, no problem. But just to give you an idea of how what a difference it can be, these are um, numbers. Actually, uh, Mike Hep did the research here, but he uh, took some he took some pictures with his camera and compared some file sizes. And he had an image that was three inches by four inches at 600 pixels per inch. And when he saved it as a raster EPS, because EPSs can be saved out of Photoshop. Uh, it ended up the file ended up being 24.7 megabytes, which is a pretty big file. Um, it, it, if you were transferring this across the internet, it would take quite a while. You could not attach it to an email because it's just way too big. But EPS is a very large format. It, it, EPS always takes up a lot more room than you really have to. So better than if it's a raster file, better than saving it as an EPS. You'd be better off saving it as an RGB TIFF. And in this case, he saved it as an RGB TIFF using no compression whatsoever. And it was 9 megabytes, which is certainly more reasonable than 25, but um, still quite a large file, pretty large to transfer via an email attachment. However, take that exact same image and save it as RGB TIFF, but using LZW compression. And if you remember, that's a lossless compression, and it's basically a no-brainer, a good one to use. Takes that 9 megabyte file down to 3.3 .3 megabytes. So now we're getting into territory where it could be attached to an email without a problem, and it's not really too much room. So this is actually what I would call the sweet spot. My guess is that RGB TIFF with LZW is your best method. That's how to, that's your best way to save good quality files. Now if we go a little further and start using JPEG compression, you start to get an idea how much JPEG compression can really make files small. If you've got an extreme need to get it to transfer across uh, the internet fast, this same file that was 25 megabytes in EPS format using a quality 8, which is medium quality, um, you can make it 350 kilobytes, um, which is 
quite a bit smaller. That's if you, a thousand kilobytes would be one megabyte. So uh, it's a pretty small file. Um, and then just to give you one more example, if you take the same image with less resolution, and see, remind you that uh, these numbers above came from a 600 PPI file, the exact same image at 300 PPI, if you save an RGB TIFF with LZW, it was 3.3 megabytes for the 600 pixels per inch, but only 1.6 megabytes for 300 pixels per inch. Let me drive this point in just a little bit more. Uh, this, these are, this is again data taken from Mike Hepp's camera. He has a Canon EOS Rebel, which is actually a 12 megapixel camera. And I can tell that because if you took these pixel dimensions that he's got here, uh, and this is his large pixel dimensions, if you take 4, 4272 times 2848, it comes out to 12 million pixels, which is 12, 12 megapixels. So these are the settings that he's got available to his camera. He can take a large image which is 4272 by 2848 and using fine compression fine in, in camera terms means high quality it's a JPEG compression but that saved his file out at 4.3 megabytes using the exact same pixel dimensions taking a large image but using normal compression settings which is a lower quality compression setting it can be only 2.2 megabytes and then so on I, I won't labor every single thing but it's an interesting chart using a medium size file which the pixel dimensions are smaller and using a high quality compression two and a half megabytes using the same size file using a lower quality compression 1.3 megabytes and then all the way down to a small file which is far f fewer pixels with normal compression less than a megabyte apiece but his camera also has the ability to save in raw format um, and it actually naturally uses a compression a lossless compression but it uses 14-bit data at the large size that's 15.3 uh, megabytes and if he used 8-bit data but uncompressed it would be 34.8 megabytes that's how that's the full size of his sensor at 8-bit so it's a pretty big file that can that same file at 34.8 megabytes with a lower quality compression can be only 0.8 megabytes. And I wanted to show you one more thing. I just had to show you my camera. This is uh, my old camera that I had uh, bought it back in 2003. I do have a newer one, but I still like this one a lot. And the way the different formats that I can save in it, I can save a RAW file. Or in my case, this is not common for digital cameras, but mine does have the ability to save as a TIFF. And it's actually an uncompressed TIFF, so it's very large. And then I've got three JPEG settings, fine, normal, and basic. And to get the most pictures on my camera, on my card, I'd use JPEG basic. But that's also the lowest quality. And one last thing, I know you're probably tired of all these numbers, but it's uh, really, this is an eye-opening thing here. This is actually a picture taken from my... Uh, my wife's camera, uh, she has a Canon Elf, which is a great little camera. It's one of these little um, little put-in-your-pocket camera. And I call them PhD cameras because uh, basically uh, PhD, push here, dummy. Um, you push the button and it takes a picture and you don't have to think about it. And it does a great job. Um, you know, it doesn't do everything you might want it to do, but it does a great job. And she has a whole lot of different settings. I'm going to point out that S super fine means... Um, basically means the highest quality setting you can have. And what I find interesting here is if we go across, we're actually changing our compression settings. And what's kind of cool about this is they've got the little S for Superfine showing a nice nice curve here. And then Fine has about the same curve without the S. But then Normal Setting gives you this little stair-stepping thing. Basically, they're pointing out that if you choose this setting, you're going to see the pixels. You're, you're not going to have as high a quality an image. And then she's also got the ability to change the size, um, large, medium, or small. So what's interesting here is if you use, um, if she goes all the way down to her smallest size image using the lowest quality compression, what's fascinating here is this number. Uh, I'm going to point you to this number that's in the bottom right corner. At large size, super fine compression, she can fit 322 pictures. This is the number of pictures that she can fit on her memory card, which at the time I took these pictures was uh, one gigabyte. 
So at her highest quality setting, she could fit 322 images on her card. However, at her lowest quality setting and smallest size, she could actually fit 8,849 pictures. Obviously, these pictures wouldn't be very high quality, you know, similar to perhaps a cell phone camera, but, but hey, you can, that shows you how much you can fit on there. So I thought that was fairly eye-opening. Let's talk about zooming. Um, when you're buying a camera, sometimes you'll get, uh, it's got this much optical zoom and this much digital zoom. And just be aware of something. Um, if I use my zoom lens to zoom in on this little rabbit, if I use a, a 10 time optical zoom, it'll look pretty good. Uh, you know, it's not quite as good as that, but it looks good. What optical zoom means is the lens itself has the ability to zoom in. In other words, you're actually increasing the focal length. So it's just like a telescope. You're getting more magnification. But if you use the same thing uh, with a digital zoom, you're going to get something like this. I put zoom in parentheses here because a, a digital zoom is not really a zoom at all. All it is is actually like zooming in, well I, it's hard to, not to use the term, is to basically zoom in and then interpolate the pixels. Uh, some of you may have seen that coming. Um, it's just creating pixels where there weren't any before. It's not really grabbing any new pixels. It's just interpolating, so the quality is not as good. As far as I'm concerned, digital zoom means basically nothing because you could do the same thing in Photoshop. It doesn't mean anything to the camera. And the last thing along size lines when trying to figure out size, I always make this point that people might say, well, I'm capturing an image, but I only want to use it three inches wide because it only needs to be on a single column. But suppose you do take a good picture and... You, it ends up being something that might be usable for the cover. If you didn't capture the image at high resolution, it's not going to be big enough to go on the cover. So I always point out to authors that if you ever want to get on the cover, you've got to think big. You've got to take big pictures to get on the cover. Now, there are other applications you can use to uh, work with raster um, images. And uh, I'm just going to point out a couple of them because Photoshop is not the only thing. There's also Photoshop Elements, <laughs> which is really just the um, more uh, Photoshop itself is a professional application, whereas Photoshop Elements is a little more user-friendly, and it's a lot cheaper. It's, uh, I think it's still less than $100, and it does a great job. It, does, it has m most of the important things that you need from Photoshop. As long as you're not converting to CMYK or doing some other things, their Photoshop Elements will probably do the job just fine. There's also some web-based image editors like Picnic or Photoshop Express um, where you don't actually have an application running on your computer at all. You just use it out through the web. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with these, so I probably wouldn't be able to answer much about it. And then, of course, there's an open source application, probably more than one, but GIMP is the, probably the most famous. It's a very good... Uh, uh, image editor and because it's open source it's absolutely free um, so a lot of people do like using GIMP and there's a lot of others out there but I know that these all the important thing is that make sure the application you use does have color management support it needs to be able to recognize and embed ICC profiles these all can um, but there's a lot of software out there and if you're thinking of buying something you want something cheaper I mean, I definitely can recommend Photoshop Elements, but make sure it has ICC support. Uh, one little tip is just about um, if a lot of people actually need to capture information from their screen, uh, display information on the screen, you want to capture it and publish it. Um, for, for Windows OS, Snagit is a great application. I use it myself, and... Uh, it's really good. You can also use Alt Print Screen, which uh, throws your screen to the clipboard, and then you can just paste it into anything. But I, Snagit is it, it's worth it's worth spending a little money on. It is a paid application. I'm not sure how much it costs, but it's a great application. If you're using a Mac, there's a you've got a couple different options um, that are actually provided to you. Uh, Shift Command Three will capture the entire screen, save it as a as a ping file on your desktop. 
And if you choose shift, if you just hold down shift command four, um, it'll let you choose a selection. You can grab just the area you want instead of your entire screen. Same thing, it saves it as a ping file on your desktop. But also with the system, you have a nice little application called Grab. It's in your application's utilities folder called Grab. It can let you capture the entire screen or a selection or just a window. You can also do a time screen, which is nice. If you need, if you need to capture a pull-down menu, um, you need to have a time screen. And it will actually save it as a TIFF for you, and you, can, you get to choose where to save it. It's a nice little, nice little application. Okay, a couple more uh, just little tips. Um, don't use patterned or textured fills in graphics. Um, this mean vector or raster. It's much better to use solid fills or percentage screens. And I'll show you why. This is a great example of one. You can see the difference, but it, it it's just not visually pleasing. It's kind of hard. It's just hard, kind of hard to look at. But what's more key is if you look at this legend, it's kind of hard to tell which is which legend is talking about which thing here. So you're definitely much better using uh, difference in, uh, I'm sorry, shaded shaded fills like this. This is the same graph, however it's using 20% changes in black. And now you can really tell which one fits what. Um, definitely a better choice. And if you use at least a 20% difference in percent, that's very effective. You can really see the difference. Another nice little tip, uh, if you have extra white space all around your image, there's a great little tool just called Trim. It's under Image, it's under the image, and you just choose Trim. Choose the top left pixel color, it'll just, it'll just trim out this white out background and go right to your, um, your image. And this would work with any color, say it was a solid black, it would trim it away. Now let's talk a little bit about multi-panel figures because building multi-panel figures can be a little tricky. The first suggestion I have is build a template. Um, f like say for instance you were uh, using Photoshop and I'll use, uh, you, you know that you're going to make a figure, a multi-panel figure that is one column wide. So for the Journal of Nutrition, one column wide would be, uh, if I use picas, it would be 20.5 picas. And I kind of suggest just setting your height to what your maximum height is, because you can always crop it down later. So you, in this case, you choose 58 picas in, in height. And the important thing is resolution. Um, if you're creating a combo image, you know it's going to have some text and some uh, image data, then you'll want 600 pixels per inch. And in my case, uh, I want to have some color information, so I'm going to choose RGB color. Again, creating, you always want to use RGB color. And then what you get is a template that's one column wide. It's, this is the maximum space you can do. And then you can add images as you want, um, you know, add, add text as you want. But this is a great place to start to, to, to be, to, if you want to know that it's going to end up the right size. Another way, you can also do it in PowerPoint. If I make a new file in PowerPoint, let me go ahead and get out of this one, and I'm going to start a new file. Uh, sorry. So, if, say, say I start with a blank presentation in PowerPoint. I need to bring it over to this screen. Now PowerPoint is by by um, default is going to make a 10 by 7, but if you wanted to make it your template size, all you have to do is go into go to your home. Uh, I'm sorry, to your design and go to page setup. It's going to start by 10 by 7. You'll need to know the actual uh, um, dimensions, if I remember correctly. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember this off the top of my head, but let's just say it was 3 inches by 10 inches. Once you've done that, then you've got a, a figure that's an actual column width. And then you can build your art into here. That way, you know, because most people, most authors I do believe just, you know, may put their figure on here at 10 by 7, and then it has to be resized. But if they've put 
text it a small size on there, you can't reduce it so much. So it makes it, it makes it very difficult to size well so that everything can be seen. So if you start with an actual template that's the size you want it to be, then as you build your art, it'll end up working for you. And it won't need to be resized. So that would be step one is to create this template. But then once you've created step one, hang on just one second. Let me just jump forward a size. The second, place and size your individual panels. Um, build the artwork, in other words. Place them there. Uh, one recommendation is keep at least a pica between the panels. You don't want their panels being right on top of each other. One other thing, in Photoshop, use the place command. It's, it's very tempting to use copy and paste, but I'm not going to go into all the details, but using place, in other words, if you were in Photoshop, you'd actually say file place and then you you can you could pick um you can pick hold on let me just go ahead and grab I'll grab my my um water lilies file here and I'll place it and what's nice about placing is it actually places it as a smart object which means it can be sized down really small and then later it can be sized back large and it will still look good so that's it's just a better way to place artwork in Photoshop. When you're putting text in, keep the text between six to ten points. Um, s smaller than six gets harder hard to read, and larger than ten just uh, it's just not needed really. Um, so, and that's the nice thing about if you've built a template, this text shouldn't ever be too small or too big. And then last of all place labels, in other words, A, B, C, D. Um, choose uppercase, top left corner. Use 10-point Helvetica or Arial Bold. If it's on a continuous tone image, in other words, a picture, inset it about six points so it's not right at the edge. And if you're placing a label on line art, just make sure it doesn't get lost in the figure because it's you know a black label. It may look like it belongs inside the figure when it's really supposed to be outside the figure. So um, you know there's a lot of different ways of doing this, but make sure it doesn't get lost in the figure. One more thing about Microsoft, I wanted to point to um, if if you've got authors that are using Microsoft, this is a great place to go. Sheridan.com guidelines ms office html. It talks about how to handle making stuff in my in office because there are some important things here okay and now let's actually talk about some live sample figures that I've grabbed from advances in nutrition um, and what I've I, I went through some old issues and just found some stuff and I found as a general rule the artwork looked pretty good so I was able to easily find a good vector image and I'll show it to you and we'll talk about it a little bit um, I also was able to find a decent raster image, and I'll sh show you, you know, some of the good things about it and uh, some of the caveats. Um, I was also able to find a uh, a PowerPoint file, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about vector versus raster in this. I was also able to find some poor quality JPEGs. I'm sure you've seen them too, <laughs> um, and. I also am going to talk about a poor quality PDF that I found and what was provided as a fix. So, let me go ahead and go to them. Okay, here's our good PDF. This We had a, um, I found a vector file and it was a very good looking file in uh, PDF format. Sorry, I'm just opening up Acrobat here. My computer takes a little bit of time on Acrobat. Here we go. So here's a good example of a, a very good vector file. Um, looks good at any magnification. I can zoom way in on this thing. It will always look good no matter how much I zoom. So this... this uh, image can be printed at any size. Well, obviously you don't want to reduce it too much because the text would start to get too small, but this is a good high quality vector artwork. Enough said on that one. Now I'm going to go and show you a TIFF file that was actually a good decent TIFF. And what's interesting here is 
you wouldn't know it from looking at it that it was raster at all. From looking at it on the screen, it very well could be a vector file. Um, the only way you can tell if it's a good vector file is to zoom in. You remember by, from looking at the last one, no matter how much I zoomed in, it was nice and clean. But if I zoom in on this one, you'll notice that I can start to see the pixels. Um, and here's where the question becomes, how good is good enough? Because the fact of the matter is, an image on screen will always look good at the pixel dimensions. And let me show you something interesting here. If I go to view, and I say actual pixels, what this means is, every pixel in the image is occupying one pixel on this monitor. Um, and whenever you show an image at actual pixels, it should look good. But that doesn't mean it's going to look that good in print. So what I, this, I'm going to actually suggest something a little bit crazy to you as a way of determining if an image is going to look good. What you'll want to do is, I'll call it the three times rule. You'll want to display it three times larger than it's actually going to appear in print. Like in this case, I'm showing it um, on this screen, and I would actually say, take a ruler to it. Grab, pull a ruler out and measure the width of this. And in my, in my case, this width is 11 inches wide. So if I use the three times rule, I could say, well, it, it looks good on my screen at this size, at 11 inches. That means I could print it, you know, around three and a half to four inches, and it would still look good. Uh, let me see if that makes sense. Um, you're always going to want to show it three, in, uh, three times larger than it really would be. So say, for instance, you wanted to print this at... Um, uh, eight inches wide. Then, of course, you can't do this on your monitor, but you can, you can kind of guess. Um, you, can, you can enlarge it, just uh, zoom in on it, so that it's um, very wide. And if you can start to see problems, you'll know that it might not actually print that large. Um, I know it's a little tricky, but just looking at these can really make a difference. Now, this one would actually look okay. It'd be legible. The, the text is all legible at a, at a fairly large size. So this one would be okay um, to go like this. So this is a good TIFF. It could print good at three inches wide. Now I'm going to show you a power, another PowerPoint file. And this one is a bit of a surprise because when you look at this PowerPoint file, at regular um, magnification, it actually looks like it could be vector artwork. Um, it looks good on the screen, no problems. However, and it is it being a PowerPoint file, sorry, let me step back. It being a PowerPoint file, it could very well be a vector file. However, if you zoom in on it by going to View, Zoom, and let's just go crazy. Let's go to 400%. Once you zoom in, all of a sudden you realize that this is a raster image. It's actually composed of pixels. And you can actually see some JPEG artifacts. Some uh, These are caused, I showed you these earlier. These are the artifacts that are caused by, um, uh, by compression. Now, the basic rule to follow is with this kind of stuff, if it's, it's going to look like this, if it comes in looking bad, it's going to publish looking bad. Unfortunately, as we talked about, there's no way that you can actually just wave a CSI magic wand and poof, make everything look clearer. That, that application actually doesn't exist. Um, it's, it's, it's Hollywood magic. Um, I, I've, to know what I'm talking about, if you've ever seen CSI, how they'll take a you know, a security camera, and they'll they'll push a couple buttons, and they'll take something that's all blurry, and zoop, and all of a sudden you can read the read the name on the guy's name tag and stuff like this. Um, unfortunately, that really doesn't exist. Uh, it's it's not possible. It is just Hollywood magic. So we run into the exact same thing. This file is not bad. You can read it, but it's certainly not good vector quality. So. Just want you to be aware of that. Even though it looks just fine at 100%, it may not look as good in print. So again, you'll want to use the three-time rule. Um, 
right now, if, if I measure this, it's um, it's about four inches wide, and it looks okay at about four inches wide, which means a third of that would only be an inch and a half. So let's zoom in a little bit more. If I go into two hundred percent, now this it's it's actually eight and a half inches wide. So this is how it would look at two and a half. So this one's a little bit. I can start to see some. You know, I can see that it's not particularly super high quality. So it's a this would be a judgment call. Um, it's not super high quality, but at two and a half inches wide, it might be okay. If I zoom in even more, say to uh, let's go to three hundred percent, I'll start to see that you know I can't print this thing really large and have it look really good. Okay, let's move on to the um, the actual very definitely poor quality JPEGs. This one is not hard to see at all. Um, even at actual pixels, you can you can actually see some JPEG artifacting here. So the, this definitely has quality problems. And if I zoom in just to make it ridiculous, you can tell that it's just not good quality. And unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done to fix this. The only thing that can be done is to recreate this. Um, and one more. This one actually isn't too bad. Um, again, though, at this size, it looks okay. And if I measure this, this is um, about nine inches wide. So we'd probably be okay printing this three inches wide. But if we zoomed in a little bit more, we can start to see that actually it, it's uh, a little bit more. I zoomed in a lot more. But yes, the quality is not particularly great. So, And again, it's the same deal. Because this is raster, you can't just go in here and change the text. It, has to, it would have to be completely reset to make it look good. So um, there you go. And last of all, I'll talk about one more. Actually, this was a PDF that we received. And uh, um, this one you can see right off the bat. You don't even have to zoom in that the quality is just not good. In this case, it's not necessarily a resolution. so much. Well, it's a mixture of resolution and just this font doesn't work very well. It's too bold. It's been something kind of... Uh, nasty has happened to it. <laughs> um, it's kind of fattened up and it just really is not good quality. So I happen to, this is the one I happen to know that um, was sent back to, to the author and what the author did was actually they uh, reset it. If you'll, I'll go ahead and show you a back and, quick back and forth. That was the original figure and then the author provided, a comp it's the same information but it's uh it's completely redrawn and this is in vector so if i zoom in on this no matter how much i zoom in we've got good quality text so obviously v again vector is the way we want to go and uh luckily the author went ahead and did this and what's kind of interesting to me about this is um as you can see there's a difference between the original figure and this one if we were had to reset this you know we need to make the time to make sure it looked exactly the same as the original whereas an author has the ability to kind of choose what's okay to them so um, it's always far easier to create art than it is to recreate art so there we go uh, in, do you have any questions about this we will go ahead and move on to one second, two section four now.